And uh, this morning we continue in our short series on the Song of Songs, and our chapter is chapter 2, verses 1 to 16, and uh, we have Karen here to read for us. Thanks, Karen. Songs of Song, Songs, chapter 2, Her Words. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. His words. As a lily among the brambles, so is my love among the young women. Her words. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands. There he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet, and your face is lovely. Catch the foxes for us, little foxes, that spoil the vi vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. My beloved is mine, and I am his. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures, and we thank you for this book, Song of Songs. We pray that as we reflect on the love that's expressed in these verses, that we would also know and experience the love that you have for us, and also express our love for you, our God. Now, Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, what, what in life makes you happy? What brings you joy? Well, it can be said that whatever you enjoy, you love. Take, for example, food. Right? Does anyone here like food? Anybody? Anybody like food? Yeah, I think it's a common thing that people like food. Of course you do. Of course you like food. But not just any food, right? We all have some foods we like and some foods we don't. There are foods that we can't get enough of and then foods we just wished didn't exist. Now, my kids aren't the pickiest of eaters. They're pretty good, but they have their moments. I'll never forget the time when my older son was about four years old and he walked into the kitchen right before dinner. And I probably told you this before, but he walks in before dinner. He saw his mother getting the food ready and he said, Ah, oh, is that what we had yesterday? <laughs> and she replied, yes, but she also let him know that his question wasn't very polite. And so he said, okay, then please put no food on my plate. Thank you. <laughs> so he made it way more polite that way. So there are foods we don't like, and then there are foods we love. It's a matter of taste, right? But the foods we love are the foods we enjoy. The foods we enjoy are the foods we love. And it can be said that whatever you enjoy, whatever you enjoy, you love. To enjoy is to love. 
And I know we, the word love can mean a lot of different things, but one of those things that love means is enjoyment. It means enjoyment. Well, today we're going to revisit the theme of love in the Song of Songs, especially as it relates to enjoyment. Now, last week my wife told me she liked my message, but I took a little too long to clarify that I was going to keep my Song of Songs sermon with a PG rating, okay? So I'm just telling you this to clarify. That's why I'm keeping it again today, okay? I know some people interpret this book differently, but my view is that we should really interpret the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, as it's called, that we should interpret this book biblically because it's in the Bible. To interpret a book of the Bible biblically really means to interpret it in light of the gospel. It should be understood Christologically. In other words, it should be pointing us to Christ in some way. And so I explained more about that last week. And if you missed that message, you can find it online. But the idea is that we should be seeing this in a biblical light, a Christian light. And so that's why we have this basic principle of interpretation here that I'd say we uh, understand the Song of Songs as, whoops, oh, other way, there we go, okay. In the Song of Songs, the love between a man and a woman serve as an allegory of the love between Christ and the church. And that's a, a traditional way to understand it, but I gave you some explanation for that last time. This love that is a great uh, parallel between Christ and the church, this love has different expressions. You know, you can see it in terms of praise and adoration. You can see it in terms of longing and desire. And you can see it in terms of enjoyment, which is what we're focusing on today. To enjoy is to love. Now, you might think, I understand the joy of love in terms of romance, but is that really a part of my Christian faith? Is that really how I define my understanding of what a Christian is supposed to be? And the answer is yes. Enjoyment it should be a part of your faith. In fact, the enjoyment of God is an essential way that we love God. It's a, and it's also a major theme in Reformed theology. The Westminster Confession of Faith, the Shorter Catechism, I should say, the first question is this, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. You know, you're, that's, a, that's essential. This is how we understand loving God. The, the highest, greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How do we love God? Well, we love God by glorifying Him, praising, adoring Him. But we also love God by enjoying Him. As a congregation, we say that a part of our purpose in our purpose statement is to glorify God and enjoy him together. Right? We, we, we are here to enjoy God. Enjoyment is a real thing. But that's not always the reputation we have as Christians or even in Presbyterian Reformed circles, this idea of enjoyment. In my last church before I came to Tottenham, there was a community ecumenical service and a woman from another faith, you know, church tradition came to me afterwards and said that I blew away her stereotype. She said she always thought of Presbyterians as being stern and dour, but I wasn't like that. Or at least I wasn't like that that day. Okay. <laughs> but she was surprised. She was surprised. It, and... and you know, I, I never thought of myself or Presbyterians that way, but that apparently is the reputation we got. It reminds me of a picture I saw on the internet of Charles Spurgeon, who was a well-known Baptist preacher, but a Calvinist nonetheless. And uh, this is what I found. It says, what do you mean Calvinists don't smile? I'm smiling right now. Right? That's the rep. There's the reputation we have, right? Now, I'm not saying we, we should live every day with a fake perma smile. I know there are some people who probably think we're supposed to do that. Just look like we're happy all the time, even when we're not. But I, I, I think really what we want to do is have our joy that's real, just simply shared and expressed. There's nothing wrong with, with smiling. In fact, that's what we should be doing. But maybe we're not expressing the full joy of our faith as much as we, we could. And that's one of the great things about the Song of Songs is that it shows us that we're actually allowed to live out our joyful love for the Lord. We don't actually have to hide that. We can be happy and expressive about our faith. 
And that's really what we see in this book. Now, our reading does begin with that well-known line, uh, the, the, the language of flowers and so on. Whoops, sorry. It talks about, I am the rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. He says, as a lily among brambles, so is my love among young women. Now, that is really one of those typical pieces of the, the song that shows that a man's beloved is like a young woman who stands out among all the others. Right? Like a flower among the common shrubs. Now the women are thinking, that is actually a good line. Write that down. You know, say that to me. So say that to their husbands, right? Because that's better than the one about having hair like a goat. Okay, that's it's up there, right? From last week. That's a better line. But this theme of love in terms of praise and beauty, that's throughout the book. And that's, that's one of those lines. But, but then the response from the young woman moves to the theme of love as enjoyment. Right? You may have noticed that. It wasn't just, okay, you're so handsome and so on, although there are parts of the song that are like that. Her words say this, As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved a young, uh, among the young men. So he does stand out too, as an apple tree among the common trees. But she says this, With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Great symbols of enjoyment, what's a great symbol or metaphor for enjoyment? Food, right? Isn't that something we enjoy? We enjoy food. If you enjoy being with someone, you could say, I enjoy them, and I think that person's really sweet. If you don't enjoy being with them, you can use other taste metaphors like bitter or sour or something like that. But when you say someone is really sweet, that means that you really like that person. And if you enjoy them, you could say in some level, some way, you do love them. Because to enjoy is to love. Now, I know, uh, of the, you know a few years ago, many of us had to suffer through this whole pandemic, right? COVID, right? We, we, it was very dangerous for some people. For most of us, it would make us sick, be like a flu and so on. But what was the strangest, unique symptom of COVID? It was losing your sense of smell and taste. Losing your sense of taste. Did anyone get COVID and lose their sense of taste? Anyone? A few of us. I experienced that. And you know, although getting sick always feels terrible, losing your sense of taste was worse than I thought it was going to be. Because it really did take, you takes food and takes strips away all the enjoyment of eating food. So if you do enjoy eating your favorite foods, take away that joy and uh, take away the flavor, <laughs> and you, you, you're really missing something. You really, really are. I really do enjoy eating food, okay? So, so you can only imagine how bad it was. I'm not trying to say feel bad for me, but it was, hard, it was worse than I thought it was going to be. So much worse. And, and I'm, so, I'm so glad that I got that taste back. Okay, let's use a different analogy. How about Lent? Lent, right? People give up food, really good food for Lent. We try to give that, that sort of stuff up. But the thing is, joy and food, like food is a great, a great metaphor for the enjoyment or love of food. We love the things we enjoy. And this is a theme that's continued through the, the passage. Here in verse 4, he says this, probably the best known line of the entire book of Song of Songs. He brought me to his banqueting table and his banner over me is love. You've heard that song. Anyone heard that? You know, I am my beloved's and he is mine. That's another verse. That's here in verse 4 and verse 16. My beloved is mine and I am his. But that, that line is probably the best known of the whole book. Now, we might think, though, well, what is, what's really being said there, though? How often do you have a banner over you and what does that really mean? Well, a banner, of course, can be used for decoration. But a common use for banners was really used for identification. A banner really served to be something of a flag. Right? If you think of uh, a, a group of a military group in ancient times marching together, traveling together, how do they identify their unit or their group? They would carry a banner, a standard, to identify who they were. Or in certain camps and groups, even in the Old Testament in Numbers chapter 2, banners were used to identify a family or clan. So you can imagine a banner waving like a flag in the air over the camp to identify who is there. But here it says that his banner over me is love. 
the banner is over me. His banner of his identification is also shared with me, but it's a banner of love. We are under that identification of our Lord and his love. That's the banner over us. That's how we gain our sense of who we are. We're in his camp. We're in his family. We're in his tribe and his, his close connection. His banner is over me. And it's a banner of love. It's a wonderful image. But it also talks about bringing me to his banqueting table, as the song says. But in the Hebrew, it really says his, uh, his banqueting house. And the word for banqueting is really the word for wine. So it's like he brought me into his wine house, where you would drink wine and really spend time together, but also celebrate. It's a place of joy. Again, though, the image of eating and drinking, of enjoyment together. That is the idea behind this concept of love. Food and drink, enjoyment, that's what love is like. And it continues on in verse 5. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. Now, so far we can see, of course, food as joy. But now we see food as, as something else. Food as sustenance. That is the other main thing for food, right? We can say some people eat to live, some people live to eat. But you know what? We kind of do both in real life, don't we? We do enjoy food. We love to uh, have a really good meal, or if you want to celebrate someone, you take them out to eat at a nice restaurant where the food's going to be good. That's a part of life, a blessing of life, is good, enjoyable food. However, without food, we die. We need food to live. And that's the other piece here, is that we need to be sustained. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples. I need my strength, I need my energy, I need my nutrition. I do have to eat food to live as well. And this reminds us that just as we might say, Jesus, I love you, you bring joy into my life, we also can say to Jesus, hey, I need you. You are my food, you are my source of life. You refresh me, you renew me, you sustain me. And didn't Jesus actually give us something like that to remind us that we need him for our life, that we need him for our strength? He gave his disciples a meal. He shared a cup of wine. He shared bread. He said, you need me for your life. Jesus gave his life, his body and blood on the cross for us. He gave us his life so that we could live. And he symbolized that with bread and a cup. And he said, I will give you life. From my sacrifice, I'm giving you life. I will strengthen you, sustain you. And that's the image he gave us in communion at the Lord's table. So he brings us to his banqueting table. And his banner over us is love when we share in the bread and cup together. But a wonderful image of food. Food is not just something we take for granted, not something we should take for granted. It shows us something of God's love for us, the love of Christ in himself. Now, we're reminded in this Song of Songs, chapter 2, you know, this idea of don't stir or up or awaken love until it pleases. There's this theme of love also in terms of longing and, and making sure that you're not needing love but not getting it. And we'll talk more about that next week. But the idea of enjoyment is strong here. But there's also this wonderful parallel, and I included it in our passage but the idea of looking forward to Christ coming again. And that's something that we do with communion, right? We proclaim the Lord's death until he returns, until he comes again. And in verses 8 and following, this is what we see. It says, The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. It's like Jesus is there at the gate. Jesus is ready to come again. And it's almost like you can see all of these wonderful parallels when we go through the uh, Song of Songs and see that Jesus, like so many connections to Jesus as the one who came, who loved us, who gave himself for us, who's coming again. And, instead, and he has these wonderful words, the words of the lover to the beloved. My beloved speaks, the woman says, and says to me, 
Arise, my love, my beautiful one, come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Aren't these wonderful images of thinking, yeah, there have been tough times in life, tough times in the world, but we trust Christ will come again and bring in his kingdom. That's when all these troubled things go away and he brings in the true joy of life in spring. We look forward to that as his people. And also, I'll just highlight this one verse in 13. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Now, that idea of the fig tree, that's something that Jesus picks up later on in his own teaching, isn't it? Where does Jesus mention the fig tree? Well, in Matthew 24, verses 32 and 33, he says this. He says, from, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that, the, that he is near at the very gates. In other words, the Son of Man is coming. And the fig tree in its seasons points to the future coming of Christ. So, so this is an image that Jesus himself draws from. You might say, well, where does Jesus pick up this idea of a fig tree? Well, we can certainly see it here in Song of Songs chapter 2. And that is a time when we look forward to someone coming, joyfully bringing an end to winter and all these uh, tough parts of life. And that's what we imagine the coming of Christ to be. He, he's going to turn all wrong things right. Bad things are going to come to an end. And he will come and really be with us in joy. He says, come away with me. Be with me. This is a wonderful connection to Christ. But he also says these words of love. He speaks of, you know, oh my dove in the clefts of the rock, the crannies of the cliffs, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Again, those ideas of beauty and adoration. But, he, but there's this kind of almost funny little line. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. We might say, what are those little foxes all about? Right? Isn't that what we always wonder when we read something like that? Who are these little foxes? Well, I think, not to go into you know, great speculation here, but I imagine those foxes as the things, if they're spoiling the vineyards, they are something that are doing some kind of damage. They're, kind of, they're getting in the way. You've got this wonderful love poem and saying, oh, I love you so much, you're so beautiful, no, you're so beautiful, and I love being with you and all this, but then there's this little problem, and he's saying, get rid of the foxes, <laughs> you know, get rid of the things that interfere with what's so good, who are spoiling the vineyards. Our vineyards are in blossom, there's something wonderful and good, but there is a little bit of a snag, there are foxes there. And you know, in our life of Christian living, in the joy of the Lord, there are things that get in the way of that. Aren't there things that distract us from enjoying God? that mess things up, that we get distracted by the events in our life and we're not even thinking about the Lord all the time because, well, I've got other things to do. And this is a good reminder to us that, yeah, get rid of those foxes. Get rid of those things that get in the way, that distract us and, and spoil our joy. Because the enjoyment of God is a key part of our faith. In fact, the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now you might wonder, where does the Bible say that? Does anyone know offhand? You've got your Bible memorized? Well, it's from Nehemiah 8.10. Nehemiah 8.10. And I think the context is really interesting for that verse. Because it leads in like this. It, the, Nehemiah has read to the people the law of God and everybody's sad because they've heard all of God's laws read to them and they're like, wow, I did not measure up. This is bad news. But then, this is what he says, he said to them, go your way to all the people gathered together who've heard the public reading of God's law for the first time ever in their lives likely. He says, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, he says, get the good food going. You know, get it together. Share the food. Share the wine. 
celebrate for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And what do they tie in with, with joy? Of course, food. Okay, of course, of course, the drink. That's what that's there's a common theme in the Bible, I, I think. You enjoy you celebrate with good food, good drink. That is a good thing. It's a blessing of God, an earthly blessing, not to be made an idol, but it's a sign that points us to the enjoyment of God Himself. And isn't this the case that we we really need to rely on that joy? That's all we need, whether you're joyful. Uh, in this moment or another moment, the joy of the Lord is going to give you the strength to live your life. You know, once you find your joy in the Lord, you don't have to look for happiness in everything else. When you only find joy in your family or your bank account or in your relationships or in your circumstances, you're going to end up being disappointed. Because not everything in life is good. Not everything in your life is going to go the way you want it to go. And so it's just a matter of time when a lot of those wonderful good things in your life just aren't going to go very well anymore. So if that's where you find your joy, where are you going to end up? To quote Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's where you get your strength. You won't usually think of joy as strength, but that's where you find your strength, is that you have a joy already so that you're going to get through those times that are not so joyful. Because you can't get your joy from your circumstances. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And that's really, if I can just say it in one summary, that's it. That's what we need to know. That's our love of God, His love for us. My prayer is that today and every day you'll taste and see that the Lord is good. All praise be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.